about the library because I found um, going out around town and talking about the library, sometimes people don't really know all of the things that we do at the library. And I always, I'll share information and some people say, who knew? Like, who knew libraries even did that anymore? So we're going to test your knowledge. That's why you have paper and pencils, which I hope you're taking, you can, of course, use those to take notes as well. But um, write down your answers when they, the slide comes up. And if you get them right, circle your correct answers. We're not going to exchange papers. We're not going to get a grade. We're not going to make you stand up and say how many you got right or wrong. Uh, it's very casual and fun, but there will be prizes at the end. So. First question, everybody knows that you need a library card to check out a book, but did you know how many books you can have out at one time from the Westboro Public Library? Is it five, 15, 50, or 500? <laughs> And while you're thinking, this is a picture of some of our staff on, um, it was National Read-A-Book Day. We saw it somewhere, so we all got a book, and we got our favorite book from the last year, and we were all pretending to read our book. The correct answer is 50. Oh, Five zero. Oh you can have uh, up to 50 items, including all of the things you see up here, all the different items that we carry, and that does, does not count towards the items that you can check out electronically. Ebooks, um, downloadable audiobooks, um, use of any of our electronic resources. So it's 50 is a lot. Um, 500 would be unmanageable because <laughs> some of us would test the limit. Uh, most items in the library can be borrowed for four weeks and they automatically renew now, which you may not be aware of. That's a change that just happened in the last couple of years. Um, what's the daily fine for returning? items late. Is it two cents, five cents, ten cents, or no cents? The answer is no cents. The library is fine free. Uh, we went fine, fine free about two years ago. And that goes for about 93%, I think I saw that statistic today, 93% of the libraries in our network are fine free. And that's true. Mm -hmm. The only thing that you have to, that you would have a fine or a fee on at the library is if you lose an item or you damage it, then there's a replacement cost, but no more late fees. Which of the following animals has not been part of a program offered at the library? We have ducks. Goats, snakes, cats, or dogs? And the answer is cats. <laughs> Even though everyone uh, associates librarians and cats and cardigans, um, we have not had cats at the library for a program. Um, we have had uh, we've had live animal programs with snakes. We've had ducks. We do duck a uh, duck hunt in the spring. Um, we've had baby goat yoga. That's what you see in the middle. Um, there was a bear on the slide. I took that off because that was silly. But um, we had a visit from Pat the bear, who is the mascot of one of the local Facebook pages. And we have had dogs. Um, a read to a therapy dog program for kids. And then, oh, and also the children's room does have two cats that have been with us for, and I do not exaggerate, decades. These stuffed cats have been there for decades. One of them went missing one time and we put missing posters up and um, social media and he came back. So, um, we also have a collection of non-traditional items called the, the Library of Things. So which item on this screen can be borrowed by patrons. So we have, starting on the left, a telescope, pickleball paddles, in the middle is a Wi-Fi hotspot, <coughs> below that is a pressure washer, up top is an ice cream maker, and bottom is a bread machine. 
So which of these do we loan at the library? I heard the right answer. <laughs> that was a trick question. You can borrow all of those. <laughs> so many more. This is Lisa, our circulation supervisor, and she's playing a ukulele, which you can also borrow from our room of things. There's all kinds of great stuff in there. Um, my personal favorite, I like to kayak, and I borrow from time to time the binoculars from the room of things because I like to look at birds while I'm kayaking. Um, we have a really active teen volunteer program called WAVE, which is an acronym for Westboro Awesome Volunteer Experience. And they, our WAVE kids run a lot of programs for patrons. Uh, so which of these is not run by WAVE? Homework Helpers, Cookbook Club, Tech Help, or Haunted Library? And we might have given away one of those earlier. Which one is not run by WAVE? The answer is Cookbook Club, um, which is an awesome program. We have a cookbook club that meets once, once a month. They either all read the same cookbook and choose a recipe and make it and bring it, or they choose um, maybe Italian food or um, desserts, and everybody makes something and brings the recipe and the dish, and they all share and talk about what they made. So that's a lot of fun. That's for adults. Each June, um, we t take part in a huge last day of school party. There's lots of delicious treats, but the library always provides popcorn, cotton candy, cupcakes, or carrots. <laughs> Which one of those do we provide? The answer is cotton candy. We love cotton candy at the library, and we love it so much, we offer it at a lot of our events. So if you're ever having an event and you want us to come and bring cotton candy, let me know, because there's me in the middle on a windy day at one of the apartment complexes doing our summer reading kickoff. And when I tell you I was covered in cotton candy, I was covered. My dog licked my arms like crazy when I got home. Here's another fun one. So how many items were checked out of our library in 2023? So last year. We have around 234,000, around 123,000, around 434,000, or around 50,000. And the answer is 234,495 items. That's a lot of items. And this is Tracy. You saw her as a fine free picture with her son Deacon on Take Your Child to Work Day. Where are you not able to use your Westboro Public Library card? These are some of the towns around us, so Hopkinton, Shrewsbury, Framingham, Grafton, or Worcester. That's right, Framingham. And I don't know if you know, but you can use your Westboro Public Library card at one of over 100 libraries between, so if you can kind of think of a line from Southboro all the way west to New York State, and then the top and bottom of Massachusetts, that's pretty much the borders of CW Mars, our network, our, which is it's also an acronym, because in library land, we love acronyms. That's Central and Western Mass um, Automated Resource Sharing Network. Um, so it also means, that as the slide says, if we don't have the book you're looking for, our library, we can get it very easily and fairly quickly from one of the other libraries in the network if they have it on their shelf. 
The library has a very active and growing outreach department, meaning that we take our services out of the building and go out to locations in the community. Uh, library activities take place at all of these, except Whitney Place, Westboro House of Pizza, The Highlands, and Arrive. Answer is House of Pizza. <laughs> so far, we haven't done programs at Best Girl House of Pizza. But in addition to all those places, um, as Janine said, our outreach team delivers items to um, all of the schools, some of the preschools and daycares in town, and to many patrons who are unable to get to the library. Our home delivery service is always available to um, anyone who needs it. I just always remind people it's not like dominoes. It's not like, oh, it's, it's raining out, I don't feel like going. Like, hey, can you bring me my latest Stephen King? Um, and it won't be there in 30 minutes or less. Um, but if you can't get to us for um, because of an injury or disability or you don't drive, um, we are happy to bring our items to you. And Carrie Brown in the center of the slide is one of our outreach people who's wonderful and awesome. Breakout books are something you might not know about. They're some of the most popular books in the library, and we buy additional copies of those books because they're in high demand, and we are able to do that and catalog them a certain way so that they stay here in Westboro, and they, um, you can't place holds on them. So they're only sitting on the shelf at the library. <coughs> So you may be number 742 on the hold list for the book you want, and you walk in and there it is, sitting on the breakout bookshelf, and everybody gets really happy. So, um, so I'm showing you a few books. Um, which of these would you say is not a breakout book? We have Lessons in Chemistry, Remarkably Bright Creatures, Demon Copperhead, and Oliver Twist. <laughs> that was that was an easy one. He was very popular in his day, but his books are no longer in such high demand. But they are fun to read. And I will say, um, the first two on this slide, if you haven't read them, were two of my favorite books last year. I absolutely love both of them. Remarkably Bright Creatures had one of the best endings of a book that I've read in a long time. Um, the library has an open house every year to showcase all the things that we offer to library patrons. Which month does this event take place in? June, September, August, or October? That one is in September. Open house is always the second Friday, or <clears throat> easier to remember, the Friday after Labor Day. Uh, we have music, usually a live band. We have food, usually pizza that is um, either purchased or donated from local pizzerias. We have costume characters, and our whole staff is usually there because it's a, one of our biggest events of the year. So uh, this year our theme was Love Your Library, and that's a few of our staff serving pizza wearing our Love Your Library shirts. Patrons wishing to read an e-book or listen to an e-audiobook need to download a free app. This app is called, and they're all sort of library related, so Marion, Libby, Bookie, or Dewey. <laughs> And the answer is Libby. You can you can download this app. You um, tell it that you're a CW Mars patron, and where when you tell it you're in Westboro, it knows you're a CW Mars patron. And then you can download ebooks for free. So if you read on a device or on your phone, don't buy your ebooks. Um, do you have? You get to choose, and most of them you can have up to three weeks. Unlike a regular book, they don't renew. 
So if you, that's the drawback to reading ebooks is if you aren't finished and it expires, it just disappears off your, out of your living library. So then you have to either get the book again or get back on the waiting list, which is always a bummer. So just keep that in mind. We can help you with Libby if you um, come to Tech Help or just come in the library anytime we're open. Our staff is happy to help you download Libby, get it set up, and help you download books anytime. Always happy to do that. We also love to celebrate holidays. Which of the following holiday celebrations is run entirely by teen volunteers? <coughs> Blind date with a book, stories with Mrs. Claus, haunted library, or New Year's Eve, which is our New Year's Eve party at 12 noon on the last day of the year that we're open. That answer is Haunted Library. And we do have teams who help out with a lot of our programs, but Haunted Library is completely run by the kids. Um, it's one of, again, one of our biggest events of the year, Open House and Haunted Library happen within about a month of each other, so it's a little bit of madness with program planning at that time of year, but they come up with the theme, they decide how they want to decorate it, they gather supplies, they create their own costumes, and then they are the actors at the Haunted Library. And they're the, the tour guides who are giving tours of the Haunted Library to the people who come. It's terrifying, it's not for small children, and um, it's wonderful. Uh, the library is also a great source of information about the town. Uh, we have an entire collection devoted to the history of Westboro. This collection can be found in Local History Room, Westboro Historical Society, the Westboro Center for History and Culture, or the Westboro Historic Commission. That was tricky. The Westboro Center for History and Culture is the answer, but if you said Local History Room, then you get that one correct too. We rebranded our Local History Room about, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, to rename it to the Westboro Center for History and Culture, because we realized we're, the things that we're collecting that are part of our history reflect our culture as well. So we wanted to kind of broaden what we were collecting and preserving. Um, it's a wonderful resource for things about Westboro. Our local history librarian is the gentleman in the plaid jacket, um, Anthony Weber, um, super knowledgeable about Westboro history and the history of colonial America. He's a wonderful resource if you ever want to know anything about Westboro. Um, the reason he's in costume is um, in October we do a murder, mystery, and mayhem tour of Westboro, which is a historical walking tour. And um, we talk about famous crimes that happened in Westboro back in the day. What year did the library open? So here's a little history. 1906, 1908, 1910, or 1912? The answer is 1908. This is what the library looked like in 1908 when it first opened. Um, it was expanded in 1980. The addition on the back was added. Uh, but. This was, this was our site in 1908. And I'll skip over this one because we talked about museum passes. Um, last question. We've been blessed to have a super custodian who does so much more than cleaning bathrooms and taking care of the trash. What is his name? We had Norm, Cliff, Sam, or Woody. And his name, if you don't know him, he's like the mayor of Westboro. His name is Cliff. So who knew? Who knew all of the great stuff that was going on at the library? We know at the library, and now you know. But I, I really, um, 
if I wanted to share all this information about the library because um, people don't sometimes don't realize all the things that we do. Um, libraries in these these times have changed a lot. We're not the the kind of quiet um, book warehouse type place that we were when I was a kid. Um, my library when I was growing up, we weren't allowed to talk and. We have to be very quiet, and our libraries, um, libraries just in these times are not, it's not a quiet place. There are quiet spaces in libraries, but generally it's a place for people to come together and um, meet each other, work on things together, um, just meet up as a social spot sometimes. And, um, and we love it when the library is full of people, and like I said, that day that's coming up with Repair Cafe, and book sale and tech help, it's not going to be a quiet day if you're looking for quiet in the library. We're actually going to talk about that as part of this next program coming up. And I want to kind of talk about some of the reasons that that, that, that happened. So um, I also want to um, talk today about the article that the library is going to have on the upcoming town meeting warrant. Um, we are Article 12C, which is uh, funding for the next phase of the library repair project. And um, Bob Petroselli, our building committee vice chair, and I are going to talk a little bit about Article 12C and about all the work that is coming up. So we'll get started with that. So the first thing, uh, I. I want to mention and thank um, the people. This is a list of all the people who are on our library building committee. Um, some of us have been working on this project as far back, all the way back to 2012, when we started the planning for the first go round of the um, renovation. We are all, it's a committee of 10 um, Westboro taxpayers. We are all Westboro residents and Westboro taxpayers, including myself. I live in Westboro. I have since 2005, and um, we, this group has put in so much time, effort, and love into this project um, that it's really just amazing. I also want to um, thank our design partners, which is Lamarose Gano Architects and Vertex, which is our project management firm. Um, Lamaro Pagano has been involved in this project since the beginning. In, um, they came in around 2015, and Vertex came in a few years ago when we needed a, a new project manager. So um, Bob's going to talk about the, the different um, options of the that we've been working on as part of our schematic design that we've, we've been doing. And schematic design is where we're creating a high-level idea of what our repair project is going to encompass. So, Todd's going to talk about that. Sure. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I just wanted to begin by first quickly saying that all the decisions and all the discussions by the Library Building Committee are all based on, or all driven by the goal of achieving all the necessary repairs in the most cost-effective and cost-efficient manner. Um, any recommendations are uh, made based on how cost-effective the repairs may be and which options make the most economic sense. And we're constantly in discussions about balancing the okay, lowest cost versus maybe the shortest term solution versus something that costs a little bit more that's going to last longer. And it's, it's, we're constantly looking into that. And I just want to remind everybody that the lowest cost doesn't always equal the best value. So we're trying to get the best value for the taxpayers. And as Maureen said, we're all taxpayers. So, um, you know, one of the things we're doing is, for example, um, the, uh, some of the repair options may have, a, some of the current repair uh, items are, maybe have an expected life of maybe five to 10 more years left. Yet the library, uh, if approved and uh, for our design development phase in, in two weeks, and then if we get the funding for next year for the actual construction, that may end up you know, being completed in about two or three years. So if it makes sense to put in an extra 
budget item to achieve some of a, the costs as long as the building's vacant and as long as the wall is being ripped apart. Let's fix something that may, the parts may end up failing in another three or four years after that instead of having to like vacate the library and do everything all over again. So we're constantly looking at that. But just to go back to the slide, um, back at the October 16th town meeting, we presented an update on the schematic design process. And at that point, the library building committee was uh, looking to document all the repairs and all uh, the code requirements along with all the related costs. And to identify the most urgent needs, the uh, library committee uh, broke the uh, repairs into four different buckets or four different options, ranging from the lowest, uh, which is just the base repair and some high priority items of $12 million, to option two, the most requested repairs and medium priority improvements at about $20 million. Uh, option 2A, the electrification and sustainability, which would come in at $28 million. Or, opt, or option three, which was throw in the kitchen sink, all of the above, and includes all the lowest priority improvements. But mindful of the taxpayer sentiment that was expressed at the past two uh, town meetings, we fixated on the lowest cost, option one, at $12 million. But um, one of the members of the public that was on our calls quite a bit suggested, why don't we try option 1A, which was basically the base repairs, but as long as it made sense to uh, do a repair or move a wall while the building was vacant and while the walls were torn down, let's come up with an option 1A, which was at around $16.2 million. So that is what we think the entire project, what we're going to recommend the entire project um, come in at is the 16.2 million. As you remember, the original, uh, the original proposal back in two, uh, two years ago that got defeated at town meeting was 38 million to tear down the 1980 edition. We're not doing that. So we're just going to do the base repairs plus some uh, most cost effective options at around 16.2. So if we have a few goals in mind for the repair project, and as um, Bob said, cost effectiveness is um, top of the list. We're looking at um, doing essential maintenance because we have systems, as he said, that are at end of life. And when I say end of life, um, they're really beyond end of life. Um, what you may not know is two weeks after the the big project was defeated in December of uh, 2022. One of the ceiling mounted fan units in the adult section caught fire. Um, the motor seized and it caught fire. Um, fortunately, it was while the library was open, so we were there. We pulled a fire alarm quickly and there was no damage. No one was hurt, uh, but the, that unit was offline. And it took until just a few weeks ago, so from December 22 until a few weeks ago to actually acquire the new motor because it had to be fabricated. Um, it's so old and obsolete. And then to get it shipped here and to get our um, service company to come and install it. And then we had to move shelves and get it installed. What you will notice is it's much more comfortable on the main floor of the library now because we have all of our fan units circulating the air. So um, that was something we couldn't defer. We needed to have our heat and our AC going, but um, it's really es essential that we get things like this done. We also need to comply with current codes, building codes, sanitation, uh, et cetera. And when you see program improvements or you hear us talking about program improvements, what, what that really means is improvements to the way we deliver services or provide services in the library. I don't want you to think program is like a computer program. Um, so as far as cost effectiveness goes, um, we are trying to identify the most cost effective way to do all of our repairs. And like Bob said, considering initial and lifetime costs um, and for us to get the best value. Uh, the building, do you want to talk about the sure. building maintenance? Spot? Sure, okay. Um, the central maintenance piece. Um, first, it was the window restoration. 
But first of all, you know, most of these repairs we knew needed to be done, but we were waiting for the town to approve the 38 million because we were going to get a state grant. So we were holding off on doing those repairs until we could actually get the state grant and get the, the total renovation done with the building being demolished. But since that didn't happen, now we're in really dire need, as, as uh, Maureen mentioned. Um, the original windows uh, from, 19, from the 1908 original structure, um, we're going to be uh, restoring them, not replacing them. Ed Baldwin, who was a uh, library trustee and chair of the Library Building Committee, talked with the uh, Historic Commission. So they agreed that we can actually re uh, restore, but not necessarily replace, to save money. Um, on the roof, both roofs, first of all, on the 1908 edition, the first is 115 years old, and the joints are in really bad shape um, and uh, won't hold up. And the roof on the 1980 edition uh, is leaking and it has a, uh, had an estimated uh, lifespan of 25 years and now we are in its 45th year. So we really need to get that roof replaced. And we're actually looking at um, the slate roof that's on, the beautiful slate roof that are on the football sections. And we thought, and so we looked into, perhaps we could replace the slate with a composite material or, or an alternative product. But the alternative product only has half the life if you actually replaced it with real slate. So we're always constantly balancing low cost, best value, long term, most cost effective option. Um, the HVAC system has a mix of older and newer parts and newer systems that may allow us to replace only certain parts that are failing and keeping the parts that are working. And um, we're still looking at trying to look at the most expensive option and then value engineering out so we end up with like a sweet spot or the price point that makes sense for the taxpayers. And the last one on their lower floor carpet is the carpet in the, the children's room and the meeting room. If you have been to the library lately, um, if you haven't been, or even if you have, next time you come, go downstairs and look down. Yeah. Um, the carpet was installed in 2005, and it has, it's so far beyond the end of life. <laughs> we clean it regularly. Cliff, who you saw in the slide in a, the trivia game, cleans it. Um, Every other month or so, steam cleans it, but it, you can't get it clean anymore. Uh, it's time. Okay, but the code compliance is one of the other uh, goals. And, you know, some of these are statutes. Some of these are required. The new addition, the addition built in 1980 uh, was built under the 1980 codes. So the new building permit to do repairs will automatically trigger newer and more robust and more complicated uh, building codes that, that we must comply with. Um, so with the Americans with Disability Act, and one aspect is making the front access, the front entrance accessible, but there are several downsides to putting up a ramp because we're looking at options about do we put a ramp on the front or do we actually have the Parkman Street side as the main area because it already has a ramp. And I know putting uh, a ramp up the front next to the steps has to go through the historic commission because you're then changing the historic integrity of the building. But then we realized too that when you put a ramp up, even if you did, when you get to the front steps, there's still three more steps on the inside. So what do you do there? You know, then you'd have to maybe take out a st one of the staircases and put in an elevator. So we're looking at all those options. We're open to all suggestions, but we're working very carefully with our program manager and the architect to put in the best program that make, makes most, most economic sense and keeps the architectural integrity of the building in, in, uh, in place. Um, we're also reaching out to the Disability Commission to see what they have to say because we really want to get the input about the folks that do need uh, ADA accessibility. We want to make sure that they have all the access they need to the building and not make them have to go to the side parking street that they want to be able to. We want to make sure uh, everyone be, will be able to access the building um, in the same manner as make it all, I'm trying to think of the word, equal accessibility. Mm -hmm. And the others speak to themselves. Yeah. Um, so as Bob said, we wanted to make some minor program improvements. So again, the way we use our space and how we provide services in our space. 
Uh, one of the ones we've had a lot of requests for is to return the two front rooms to their previous use as reading rooms. So we intend to do that, to um, create a team space. The, both of those rooms right now are used as team space. And our plan <clears throat> is to relocate the teens to a space in, towards the back. So if you're familiar with the library, in the adult section, sort of in the area where the fiction collection is located now. Um, restore the adult reading rooms, um, update furniture, more comfy furniture, um, enhance our meeting spaces. Um, our meeting room right now does not have windows and it really needs better lighting. So um, we can't put windows in it, but we can improve the lighting and the technology. Um, our data and electrical infrastructure through the whole building needs to be upgraded. Um, in some of my previous presentations, you, you may have seen the um, spaghetti that is the, the nest of cables that we have where everything comes into the building and sits on a floor, on the floor in a cardboard box. So we have one minor little improvement that's gonna fix that. And we want to expand our local history storage so we can appropriately preserve and care for our town's really precious, uh, very old documents. So to kind of give you a sense of what the changes will encompass, um, this is also on the boards up front, so later if you want to come up and look at it closely, you can. Um, the blue spots up here, so this, this would be the front entrance on West Main Street. Um, the two front rooms would become reading rooms, and we'll move um, probably magazines, newspapers, and some of the fiction books to this section, along with our room of things items that you learned about in our trivia game. The current space here where the library of things is located will become a small study room, and our main circulation will stay where it is. And then local, local history or Westboro Center for History and Culture will remain where it is. But beyond that, that wall, we'll build a teen space that's enclosed, um, probably glass, so that we can um, do a little bit of noise control. Um, and then the adult, um, the rest of the books for adults will be in here with tables, chairs, comfy furniture. We're not quite sure what or how that'll be arranged, but that's where it will be. Um, the things we're adding in this little space, three single person restrooms, which are required under the sanitary code. But I will tell you, since I've been working at the library 13 years ago, the first year that I was there, we did a community survey and people were saying they wanted better restrooms. And it's been 13 years, and I'm, I'm trying, like, I'm trying so hard to get you better restrooms. So there will be three new ones on this floor, and we will be rehabbing the ones on the lower level as well. So, phew, like, finally. <laughs> and then a small janitor closet and um, a historical storage room. Uh, we, we need a, one space that's dedicated for storage for those really precious documents. We have documents that go back to the 1700s in our collection. And we want to make sure those are preserved for future generations. So that will have its own zone on the new heating and air conditioning system so we can keep it at a consistent temperature. It won't be like an archive at Harvard. Um, we can't afford that. We wouldn't do that. It's not appropriate for a public library. But the important thing with documents is to maintain humidity and temperature. And that's what we need for those documents. So we're adding that local history storage. Uh, this is a concept of what our te new teen space might look like. And to orient you, if you know the library, um, you're standing in the back of the library looking towards the front. So this green wall would be the opposite wall of the Westboro Center for History and Culture, where it is right now. Um, so what you see here is there will be shelving with books. There will be some comfy furniture. There'll be some technology, um, possibly a laptop bar where the kids can sit with their laptops, some tables, study space. And this structure, you'll see some of these out in the main adult section as well. These are called nook pods. 
and they are movable pods that you can use as a quiet study space. Um, I've sat in these at trade shows a couple of times and there's all the noise and chaos of a trade show going on around you, but you can sit with the person across from you and have a conversation, normal conversation. You can't hear what's going on out there at all. The way they've engineered the soundproofing of these, it's open on both sides, but the way they've engineered the materials, it deadens all the sound around it. So we can hear each other, but they can't hear us, and we can't hear them. So um, that will help us uh, with some of the need for quiet study space without building something in that we, you know, once we build it, then we have it and it's there forever. So these will be movable. The ones on the, that we'll have on the main floor, we expect to have at least two of those that will be movable as well as so we can move them out of the way if we are having a program or we need them to be somewhere else. And then the front reading, Room. So this also is, um, so you're standing with your back to West Main Street, looking forward. Um, and it's, the concept drawing has it looking similar to the way it used to before COVID. Um, with our, our big wooden table, um, we'll have more furniture than this. Uh, it looks really sparse. But both of the rooms in the front have these uh, beautiful built-in shelves. So we'll refinish the shelves, move some of the collection there. We'll have nicer lighting. That's what one of the bonuses in this space. And those will go back to being adult reading space. Uh, so this is the map of the lower floor. And as I mentioned, all we're really doing down here is just rehabbing the two bathrooms, updating the technology in the meeting room, and then replacing all of the carpeting. Um, we also do have one children's program space that we use for story times and um, crafts and things like that. We're gonna close that in with a better wall. Uh, if you've ever been down there, it has a very 70s looking accordion door that folds over to one side and um, it's very tired looking and it just that it's, the handle's missing and it's really terrible looking. So we're just gonna upgrade that a little tiny bit. On the upper floor, um, I don't know if any of you have ever been upstairs to the top floor. Some of you may have. Um, sometimes there are meetings up there. Um, my, my office is here, and the assistant director and our cataloger and technology librarian are over here. This space up here is just open right now. And this space, we have a couple of staff people that work in this space, we have a big table. So our Thursday morning book club meets up here because they really like this space. It's beautiful. If you ever come to the Thursday morning book club, these are windows that, um, this side looks out at the Forbes building, this side looks out at West Main. It's beautiful up there. Um, wood floors. So we're not really touching much of this except to put in the IT closet, which I can't tell you how happy that makes us to be able to like, have all of our cabling and wiring coming into one place that is not a cardboard box. Um, but that's all we're really touching upstairs. So my uh, last slide is just a little breakdown and explanation of the cost. So in, um, this, at the spring 2023 town meeting, we asked for $360,459 to do this study, the result of which is what you just saw. This is our schematic design and our cost estimates and, um, and studies of the building to determine what we needed and what was, what was up with the heating and air conditioning system as an example. What we'll be coming to town meeting for on the 23rd is the next phase of the project, which is called design development. And that's where the architects and the project management team take the high level design that we, they, you've just seen. They refine that, um, they give more detail to it. So now we're looking at where are the shelves gonna go? How much shelving do we need? What type of shelving do we need? What kind of furniture do we want? Um, what kind of, what do we need as far as electrical? Uh, what fixtures are going in the bathrooms, where, where's the plumbing gonna go, where's the electrical wiring gonna go. 
uh, all of those little details that were, um, what we've just done is too high level for that. But they'll refine the designs, we'll finalize everything, and then the project will go out to bid. Once we get the bids back, we'll know what the exact number is for the project. And then that is what we will bring to town meeting in 2025. So to do all of that work that I just talked about, our cost that we're asking for at town meeting is um, just over 1.6 million. Um, then we expect right now the construction part that we'll be coming back for in a year <coughs> to actually implement all of the, the work and do the construction will be about 14.2. We don't really know for sure yet until we do the detailed design and get that, those bids and open them. But this is a, our design team's best estimate at this point. So um, the construction is ex expected to take about a year. Uh, the library will move out of the building so that the workers can come in, it, turn it into a construction site, do everything they need to do and get out so that we can get back in and reopen. Um, if we're not in their way, they can work faster. And if you know anything about construction, the longer it takes, the more it costs. So um, we'll be in a temporary location. We don't know where that is yet. Um, we're hoping it will be either at the, the new community center, if that's ready, or possibly if the senior center has moved to the community center, maybe that space will be available. We just don't know yet at this point. Worst case scenario, we might have to lease space if neither of those is available. So right now in our project cost, we're carrying costs for leasing space because we have to. We, just to make sure that we have enough in the budget to ask. But again, we're not asking for this. At town meeting, we're asking for the next phase of design. So um, the construction would take about a year, and then we would move back in, have the grand opening, have the big party, and um, all totaled, all the phases of the project added together right now, we think will end up costing about 16.2 million. Um, so that's just kind of the high level of the overview of where we're headed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to add too is people have commented like, well, why does it cost so much? 14 million for construction. Well, we did a community center, you know, in Worcester, and I was involved with that because I was on the board of directors for that type of community center. We only did it for the X amount. This is public construction. This is governed under Mass General Laws uh, chapter 149. We are held to a higher standard than just regular commercial uh, construction, or whether it's residential construction or multifamily residential construction in the private sector. This is governed by the Office of the Attorney General and Office of the Inspector General. You have uh, to pay prevailing wage, which is not just minimum wage. Prevailing wage is the union wage rate in the local area. All contractors and subcontractors have to have performance and payment bonds, be bonded, have special <laughs> insurance. So you're getting, you're attracting a higher caliber of contractor and subcontractor, and that is because when the state did its construct, public construction reform law, they wanted to get a better, uh, a better contractor and architect involved, so that cities and towns didn't have to go through the design, bid, build, sue uh, process. <laughs> so it's cost more to do public construction. It's just a fact of life. So that's the way it is. Yeah. So what questions do you have about the project, the library? Yes. Do you have any chance of getting funds from the state or private businesses or other sources? The I know the Friends of the Library have, there's a possible source from so, there. So um, we, we had a grant mm -hmm. from the state for, for the previous project, which we ended up having to decline because the project was not approved. So our next opportunity to apply for a grant towards this project would be in 2027 which would mean construction probably wouldn't be able to start until 2029. How much would that be and for? It's hard to, well, it's hard to know, number one, whether we would get a grant, because they're very competitive, and um, if we did, um, how much it would be, it's hard to project that, but our building cannot wait until 2029. It's not gonna, things are not gonna last, and I, like, the fact that fan units are catching fire like, work has to be done now. And we have a pump. We almost lost our heat. Um, 
Thank you for reminding me. Janine was reminding me about um, our heat system runs on, a, it's a gas-fired boiler that circulates hot water, which may be similar to what you have in your home. That's what I have in my home. But it's run, it has pumps. There are two pumps. And it's, um, we have two because we need redundancy. So if one fails, the other one kicks on, and the heat keeps going. Uh, a couple weeks ago, someone went out through the boiler room, one of our staff, our um, custodian was gone for the day. Somebody happened to go in and put trash in a trash can that was in the boiler room and noticed there was water streaming from one of the pumps. So she went and told someone, we called the custodian, sent him a little video, he was like, oh my God, he called the, the company and the water was leaking from the top pump, streaming down onto the lower pump and then going into a bucket that just happened by accident to be underneath it and it was a five gallon bucket that was almost full so our company came um, did a bypass on the system so we only have one pump running while they order us a replacement pump and so now like fortunately it's March and look at the lovely day we have it's um, it's not two degrees um, so we're running on one pump and hoping that that one doesn't go down. But if we hadn't caught it when we had, that water was, and our uh, tech told us that, our, the water would have gotten into that pump and burned that pump out and we would have had no heat. So, um, it's, like I said, it, it's work that it can't wait for the possibility of maybe getting a grant down the road. We need to do this work now. However, that said, we do have a foundation that was formed in 2017. Um, a charitable foundation, the Westboro Public Library Foundation. And their intent is to start a capital campaign as soon as the project is approved to raise funds towards um, the cost of this project. So um, they had committed to raising a million dollars towards the previous project. We haven't talked to them about it since the project was defeated, um, but what their intentions are for this project. Um, but I know that they are going to start working once the project is approved. They wanted to wait until um, they had the approval of the town because they didn't want to do fundraising and not be able to go to people to ask for funds on a project that was still up in the air, whether it would be approved or not, and then possibly have to return donations um, at the end. So there will be a capital campaign to help defray some of those costs. Is where I said when we had the $38 million project for something the brand new, we were had the $10 million grant from the state in hand, but the voters rejected that. So now we're going back, they had to go back to all, start from scratch and doing a repair project with no state matching funds at $16 million. Yeah. But also, too, as Maureen said, construction inflation has been running for the past several years at 12.8% a year. It's slowing down to about 8%. So even with that, if you wanted to delay it, thinking you may get a grant, Delaying the project is just, you're going to end up spending that money anyways in, in, an, in inflation of construction material. So that's why it's important to get this approved and get it done in the most efficient manner now. Yeah. yeah. If you, uh, can you retroactively apply for this money? No. 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 Unfortunately. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Uh, in the uh, layout, do you have some area where there are desktop computers? We probably will have some in the adult <laughs> section on the adult floor. Um, we'll probably be building some into this area. Um, not a lot, because what we're seeing, there are times right now where all of our, we have six right now, and all of them are in use at certain times, but um, those times are becoming fewer and fewer. So I think going into the future, a lot of people have their own device. They come in and, and they need our Wi-Fi more than they need our desktop computers. So we have to be aware of all of the people in the community. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not everybody has what, what we think we have. I was in a neighboring community and I also saw that they had distinctive keyboards and materials for people who might be blind. Mm -hmm. A lot of disabled people. Yeah. So I just would think that you want to include that. Yeah, thank you. And um, we have started offering 
laptops for use in the library as well. So we may transition over to, um, instead of having like fixed computer stations with des desktops, we may go to laptops and have some kind of combination. We want to just try and be as flexible as we can with the design so that as the technology changes, we're not locked into a, a certain use or a certain function that we can you know, pivot and evolve to whatever the, the next technology is. Well, I think the board is, should be uh, uh, really applauded for the efforts because I'm sure this has been very many hours. It has. <laughs> it's been a lot of hours. Yeah, and of course, you. the bottom line is we think, so how is that going to impact our particular property tax bill? Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I can't answer that today because we don't have that, if, we don't have the final cost for the construction yet. Yeah. That's coming in the next phase. So when we're here talking about that, we'll be able to answer that with a little more <coughs> definitive, solid answer. But two weeks ago, we did do a presentation before the Westboro Finance Committee, and they approved an 8 to 0 uh, for the 1.6 million to move ahead. But we did want to also acknowledge Bill Lenane, who has been a big part of the Library Building Committee and all the work and all the experience and construction that he's had over the years. And Bill's been a terrific uh, participant on the committee. So thanks, Bill. Thank you. Oh, Janine was reminding me, we do also loan Chromebooks in our library of things. Um, if you, are you familiar with Chromebooks? They're a small laptop and they run on the Chrome operating system, so it doesn't have Microsoft Word. Um, or any software loaded onto it. It runs yeah. on the internet on Chrome. And the, uh, the little boxes that were on my slide, the Wi-Fi hotspots, are a small device, the size of, it's like smaller than your phone, almost like the size of a credit card, but thicker. Um, it, those run on the cellular network, and it provides wireless or Wi-Fi internet for up to eight devices at a time. So they're great if you're traveling. Uh, every time I travel, I take one. I check one out on my library card because I don't want to use um, open hotel Wi-Fi. That's really not safe. This is a secure connection to the internet um, for you and seven other people if you want. Um, so you can check out a hotspot and a Chromebook together and have access to the, the internet. Yes. It's important to mention a couple of things. Uh, I think the, the area of the wall where you have the art and self display, and that's a great thing for local artists and people to see. The other thing that Jimmy had mentioned was Wild Prairie. It's a good turnout. Yes. Um, well, Prairie is a service we subscribe to that um, is an online Every week it gathers. <laughs> from our library catalog, all of the new items that we've added in that previous week, and it sends out an email to anyone who subscribes to it to let you know what the newest items are at the library, and you can click through to the catalog and place a hold or um, see if it's there, you can read about it, um, it gives you the book covers, and it's also on the bottom of our website, it scrolls on our website, so you can click on it from there as well. Um, I also get that, and we post it on our social media. If you um, if you use Facebook or Instagram, that's where we post most of our content, and uh, we post our weekly Wild Prairie update. Uh, some of the other Westboro Facebook pages share that, um, so other people will see it too. But I agree, that's one of that one is one of our wonderful, awesome services. So thank you all. We're um, we really appreciate you taking the time and. Um, inviting us to come and speak and we'll be here for a little while if you want to come and, and ask and if you want to uh, sign up for our email newsletter just come on up and i'll help you get signed and please up. vote on the 23rd at town meeting for our warrant <laughs> <laughs> one thing i forgot about maureen back when she was in high school she wanted to be a librarian how many of us knew what we wanted to do and are successful at it i think, I think she <laughs>